Hello, good people and free Palestine friends. This video picks up where my last one ended, which is right at the creation of the modern state of Israel in the late 1940s, all the way through 1967, which is a pivotal point in the Arab-Israeli conflict, as you'll see. It's really a, a what would you do video in which I intend to show how Israel's military readiness and might have almost always come from a posture of self-defense and necessity and not as a result of wanting to be an aggressor or an expansionist force. To understand what Israel has been tasked to defend itself against since literally day one, let's go back eight decades to the months preceding Israel's formation as a modern state. In late 1947, the UN, United Nations, stepped in acknowledging the right for Arab self-determination along with the right for Jewish self-determination, thereby proposing the partition plan to create a Jewish state and an Arab state. Mind you, this had neither been a sovereign Arab or Jewish nation for millennia. Neither side had controlled it politically for a thousand years plus. So, so the only path forward to de determine political control and its borders would be through either a negotiated process or through war. This is how all countries are formed. So what was the Jewish reaction and sentiment to this, to this situation? Jews chose the negotiated route, accepted the UN partition plan, and celebrated by toasting with champagne in the streets of Tel Aviv. And what was the Arab sentiment? The Arabs unilaterally, unanimously rejected the UN partition plan, feeling that all of Palestine should be a singular Arabic Islamic state, and thus, setting the stage for war. Azam Pasha, the General Secretary of the Arab League, told the British proconsul to Palestine, Sir Alec Kirkbride, quote, we will sweep them, the Jews, into the sea. He also predicted that when the five Arab nations declared war and attacked Israel on its very, very first day of existence, quote, this war will be a war of extermination and a momentous massacre which will be spoken of like the Mongol massacres and the Crusades. He was wrong, of course, and Israel, despite no support from the United States or Britain or any other country, defeated the attacking Arab nations in only 10 months. Israel had claimed its sovereignty and defended its borders against foreign aggression. But more than that, Israel had actually increased the scope of its land. The map to the left shows the borders Israel had originally accepted as a result of the UN partition plan, and to the right, what Israel looked like following their victory after the Arab attack. Had the Arabs accepted the UN partition plan of 1947, they would have had their state right then and there. In fact, had they simply accepted the Peel Commission plan from just 10 years earlier, this is what the original mandate of Palestine, which included Jordan, would have looked like with the Arab state in green and the Jewish state in light blue. But the Arabs chose to gamble, rejecting those plans, and go to war. And they lost, case closed. But there's an even bigger loss in the details. The 1947 UN partition plan, which the Arabs rejected, stipulated that Jews and Arabs each had a compulsory right to remain in their land without fear of religious discrimination or to peacefully immigrate into the newly created nations. But they didn't accept the plan, and as a result, roughly 750,000 Arabs were displaced from their homes, an event referred to as the Nakba, or catastrophe. Those Palestinian Arabs gained refugee status, but were denied citizenship in all of the Arab countries they entered, with the exception of neighboring Jordan. So let's state this clearly and concisely. The Arab League unanimously rejected the UN plan, which would have created a national home for Palestinian Arabs. Then, four of the five Arab nations, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt, having lost the war that they started, refused to grant citizenship to those people whose displacement was a result of their own failure. But Israel is to blame? What, what kind of pathetic, twisted logic is this? I mean, what, what kind of mental gymnastics must you adopt to somehow rationalize that Israel is to blame? Th this pattern by hostile enemies of provoking and attacking Israel, losing, 
And then complaining with bizarre grievances is alive to this day, as evidenced by the activities and attacks of October 7th and what's happened ever since. I mean, attack Israel and then ceasefire, please. Attack Israel, ceasefire, please. I mean, come on. And by, and by the way, more on the Nakba in another video, but let's get real. At the conclusion of the war, having been defeated, Transjordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt all refused to sign peace treaties and instead signed armistice agreements, which is a pact to stop fighting, but not an acknowledgement of peace. This is what the borders looked like for the next 20 years. The so-called West Bank, what would have been part of the Arab state in Palestine, was annexed by Transjordan, now just Jordan. And what else did Jordan do? They expelled all Jews from their holiest city, Jerusalem, and prohibited them from worshiping at their holiest site. Jordan's major, Abdullah El Tell, recalled in his memoirs, quote, Jerusalem was purged of Jews, and for the first time in 1,000 years, no Jews remained there. But I know, Jews are colonialists. And what about the Gaza Strip, where fighting is going on right now? It was controlled by Egypt. So, was that occupation with Egypt controlling Gaza and Jordan annexing the West Bank? I mean, after all, at that very moment, Egypt and Jordan could have disclaimed their authority to those lands and said, here you go, a free Palestinian state. But they didn't. And why not? Because it wasn't those lands that the Arabs wanted. They wanted everything in between, everything that we call Israel. Because it seems that it's only when Jews have any semblance of authority over those areas, now Gaza and the West Bank, do we call it occupied territories. But pay attention to these borders. Gaza governed by Egypt and the West Bank by Jordan. Those weren't enough for a free Palestine then. But wait until 1967 comes along. Back to 1948. Since the Arabs had signed armistice agreements and couldn't formally fight against Israel, they enlisted rogue militias to bring the fight for them. Enter the Fedayeen, Arab paramilitary groups largely financed by Egypt, who carried out hundreds of raids and attacks against Israeli civilians and military targets from the Syrian Golan Heights, from Egyptian-controlled Gaza, and especially the Jordanian West Bank. In other words, Arabs launched attacks from the exact same places you complain today are quote-unquote occupied by Israel to uproot Israeli agriculture, bomb its infrastructure, and attack civilians. Between 1951 and 1956, between 500 and 1,000 Israeli civilians were killed by the Fedayeen. So if you're Israel, what would you do? Would you allow unchecked armed fighters to continually breach your borders, raid your communities with, with no response? I mean, what, what government of any nation would allow that to occur? Would you? Israel's response? Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion established response forces such as Unit 101, a covert fighting force led by Ariel Sharon, a name to remember, that engaged in retaliatory strikes, many of them brutal and harsh. Like, really, really harsh. I, I will not sugarcoat this. Israeli response to Arab aggression was brutal and, yes, sometimes extreme. In other words, if you send the Fedayeen for Israel's people, its infrastructure, and its farms, Israel is going to strike back and strike back hard. The rationale for a firm Israeli response to aggression was explained in the 1950s by Moshe Dayan, a lifelong Israeli soldier and future minister of defense, when he said, quote, we cannot save each water pipe from explosion or each tree from being uprooted. We cannot prevent the murder of workers in orange groves or families in their beds, but we can put a very high price on their blood a price so high that it will no longer be worthwhile for the Arabs, the Arab armies, or for the Arab states to pay it. In the early 1950s, Egypt took the lead in the Arab response against Israel. Egypt's young, charismatic president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, in 1955, said, in quote, Egypt has decided to dispatch her heroes, the disciples of Pharaoh and the sons of Islam, and they will cleanse the land of Palestine. There will be no peace on Israel's border 
because we demand vengeance, and vengeance is Israel's debt. Weeks later, Nasser initiated the beginnings of the Suez Canal crisis, which would have massive ramifications going forward. A bit of background. The Suez Canal was built in the 1870s by the French and Egypt to bridge the Indian Ocean with the Mediterranean Sea. But within a few years, Egypt had so mismanaged their finances that they were forced to sell their interest in the Suez Canal Company to Great Britain, who now owned and operated it jointly with the French. Fast forward 80 years to 1956, when Nasser nationalized the canal as sovereign to Egypt and essentially booted out the French and British. He then immediately closed it for all shipments to Israel, along with closing the Straits of Tehran and blockading the Gulf of Aqaba to starve the entire population of Israel of food and supplies. These blockades were in violation of the 1949 armistice agreements that Egypt had signed with Israel, but were hugely popular with the Arab population because they were essentially seen as a shedding of European colonialism by kicking Great Britain and the French out, while also kicking Israel, the bitter enemy, in the teeth. Nasser announced, quote, Our hatred is very strong. There is no sense in talking about peace with Israel. There's not even the smallest place for negotiations. So if you're Israel, what would you do? Stand back while a bellicose leader proclaims his desire to destroy you while essentially choking you to death and, and saying that there is no place whatsoever for negotiations? What would you do? Israel did not stand back. And in October of 1956, with the support of Britain and France, attacked and regained their access to the Suez Canal, along with control of parts of the Sinai Peninsula and Gaza. Over the next decade, and largely as an outgrowth of the Suez Canal crisis, tensions continued to rise and set the stage for the next great conflict, one that has defined the Middle East region to this day. In late 1965, the 12 heads of the Arab League, along with Ahmad Shukeri, the leader of the newly formed Palestine Liberation Organization, held a secret meeting in Casablanca, Morocco, to discuss Arab solidarity and a strategy of attack against Israel. And how do we know that they were planning to attack Israel? Quick fun fact. King Hassan II, the leader of Morocco who was hosting the meeting, so distrusted his own Arab League that he secretly recorded the meetings and turned the information over to Israel because he felt they were a better, more legitimate partner than his own alleged allies. Look it up. In any case, the Arabs started consolidating and positioning their military forces behind their de facto leader, Egyptian President Nasser. He proclaimed, quote, we shall not enter Palestine with its soil covered in sand. We shall enter it with its soil saturated in blood. We aim at the destruction of the state of Israel. Syria started amassing thousands of troops on the Golan Heights overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, the one where Jesus, a Jew, purportedly walked on water. In May 1967, Nasser expelled the United Nations peacekeeping force from the border of Israel at the Sinai Peninsula and amassed 100,000 plus Egyptian troops there, to which Voice of Arabs radio broadcast, quote, as of today, there no longer exists an international emergency force to protect Israel. We shall exercise patience no more. The sole method we shall apply against Israel is total war, which will result in the extermination of Zionist existence. Syrian Defense Minister Hafez Assad echoed, quote, I, as a military man, believe that the time has come to enter into a battle of annihilation. President Nasser then once again closed the Straits of Tehran, choking Israel from its supplies of food and fuel. He then challenged it to war. Quote, we will not accept any coexistence with Israel. Today, the issue is not the establishment of peace between the Arab states and Israel. The war with Israel is in effect since 1948. Three days later, Nasser said, quote, the armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon are poised on the borders of Israel to face the challenge while standing behind us are the armies of Iraq, Algeria, Kuwait, Sudan, and the whole Arab nation. This act will astound the world. Today they will know that the Arabs are arranged for battle. The critical hour has arrived. We have reached the stage of serious action and not declarations. The president of Iraq, Abdul Rahman Aref, proclaimed, quote, the existence of Israel is an error which must be rectified. This is our opportunity to wipe out the ignominy 
which has been with us since 1948, our goal is clear, to wipe Israel off the map. The unified Arab nations had surrounded Israel with hundreds of thousands of troops, 2,500 tanks, and more than 800 aircraft ready to deploy against Israel for war. So if you were Israel, what would you do? Surrounded by hostile military powers four times as large as yours, whose boisterous leaders have been barking about wiping you off the map and into the sea almost daily for years, who were proclaiming the time had come for action and not declarations. What would you do? Remember, Jews were and are an endangered species, almost extinct, and Israel their only sanctuary. What would you do? Israel, like the undersized David of 3,000 years before, who used his wits, cunning, and nimbleness to slay the giant Philistine warrior Goliath, launched Operation Focus in what was a win or be exterminated preemptive strike. As Yitzhak Rabin, another name to remember, the leader of the Israeli Defense Forces, told the roughly 200 pilots of the Israeli Air Force, quote, Remember, your mission is one of life or death. If you succeed, we win the war. If you fail, God help us. So what happened? Israel kicked the collective ass of the Arab coalition in six days. Six! So decisive was this ass whooping of these mighty bellicose Soviet-backed blowhards who had literally been begging Israel to strike day after day for years that they were not only forced to surrender, they were forced to give up the lands that they had been attacking Israel from. In the north, Israel claimed the elevated Golan Heights from which Syria had launched countless attacks into the Sea of Galilee and its surrounding areas. To the south, Israel gained the Gaza Strip and all of the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. And to the east, Israel took the West Bank and reclaimed control of Jerusalem and its holy Temple Mount to allow Jews, who'd been its majority population for the better part of the preceding 3,000 years, but who had been exiled by the Jordanians for the previous 20. The map to the left shows what the borders had been from 1948 to 1967. On the right, you see the outcome of the Six-Day War. To those Arab leaders, I'd say this. Never have a people been so contentious, so threatening, so truculent, while losing so repeatedly, and been so damn whiny about it. I mean, come on, take your ball and go home. Allow the Palestinian Arabs, whose displacement you created, become equal citizens amongst you. After all, the Arabs that were inside of Israel have gained their Israeli citizenship and are free members of their society. Can't, can't you extend the same to your Arab brethren? Stop attacking Israel and acknowledge it exists. Because if you do attack it, Israel will fight back and win again and again and again. And stop using Palestinian Arabs as political propaganda for what you really want, which is to kill all the Jews inside of Israel and eventually all infidels worldwide. Now, it wouldn't be a fitting ending to this video if I didn't mention that when the Six-Day War ended on June 10th, 1967, it was just the beginning of the Summer of Love. You know, the Beatles, hippies, free love. And in that loving, magnanimous spirit that Jews have, Israel allowed their Muslim brethren to worship at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, even though Jordan had forbidden Jews from visiting the Western Wall during their 20-year annexation? Occupation? I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, possession is nine-tenths of the law. I know I've been a bit salty in parts of this video, but candidly, it's because I'm a bit annoyed and exhausted by the fact that Israel has to keep justifying its mere existence and has to keep justifying its right to defend itself against decades of aggression. No other country, including the one you live in, has an origin story that is somehow more legitimate or tidy than Israel's. And no other country would accept the kind of hostility that Israel and Jews 
have been forced to deal with and respond to and defend themselves against for decades. So please realize Israel is not going anywhere. And if its adversaries continue insisting on attacking it, Israel is going to fight back and fight back hard. Because after all, what would you do? In future videos, we'll talk about what came after the Six Day War in 1967 because, well, it's a doozy. But until then, please be kind to each other.